Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this session of the Trans-European Policy Studies Association pre-presidency conference, uh, focusing on migration. And as well as TEPSA, it's being held in partnership with Nova University in Lisbon. My name is Tom Law. I am the media policy advisor for the Global Forum for Media Development. And as well as that, in my role as a consultant and trainer, I've been involved in training journalists around the EU um, when I was working for the Ethical Journalism Network, and more recently working with ICMPD, the International Centre for Migration Policy Development. I've been training journalists in Eastern Partnership countries on migration reporting, and recently um, finished drafting a handbook on reporting on migration for journalists. Um, so that will be published um, early next year. Now, the title of our session today is In View of the Pragmatic and Flexible Characteristics, is the EU new pact on migration and asylum the proper way forward? Now, as you will all know, the pact sets out the Commission's new approach to migration, addresses border management and aims to ensure more coherence to integrate the internal and external dimensions of migration policies. Now, before I hand over to our speakers, I want to highlight some of the main critiques of the pact, which hopefully they'll be able to address in their presentations, or we may return to them in the questions at the end. So they're gonna speak for 15 minutes each, and at the end, we'll have time for questions. So some of the main critiques that um, have been made of the pact um, is that the, the pact allows member states to opt out from participating in the relocation of asylum seekers and refugees within the EU by offering them the possibility to instead provide administrative or financial support to other member states. Now, this is pragmatic, considering the positions of Poland and Hungary, for example. Is this viable? And at what cost does this pragmatism come? Now, border security, um, critics say, has also been prioritised over access to asylum. I wonder if our um, speakers um, agree with this. And while the pact does emphasize the principle of non, non refoulement which is enshrined in international refugee law, the pact at the same time does introduce some measures that critics say are meant to complicate the possibility that individuals fleeing persecution and conflicts can seek or obtain protection in the EU. And also in regard to the relationship between the EU and third countries, there's been a long-standing policy of externalizing the cost and responsibility of managing the EU's external borders, tying policy issues such as development assistance, trade, security, education, agriculture, and visa facilitation to cooperation on migration management. And some argue that the pact takes this relationship to a new coercive level by suggesting the possibility of applying restrictive visa measures to third countries who are unwilling to be um, cooperative. And finally, um, there are critics that say that the pact lacks a foundational basement by recognizing that the overwhelming majority of the world's refugees are hosted in developing countries. And um, there was an article uh, from the Brookings Institute that said that the EU should incorporate policy ideas from the global compact on migration to rectify this. Now, we won't go into answering any of those uh, now, or I won't certainly, because I'd like to introduce our three speakers. Um, they'll each present for 15 minutes each. And um, while they're speaking, please do think about questions that you may have. Feel free to post questions and discuss in the chat box that's available. And uh, we'll try and have as much time as possible to answer your questions at the end of the session. Our first speaker will be Yap Deswan from, the, from TEPSA, the Secretary General of TEPSA, and he is the Emeritus Professor at the University of Rotterdam, of the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. And he's spoken actually at TEPSA's previous two pre presidency conferences on migration in Berlin in June this year on migration and asylum, and in Zagreb in November last year. And I'll be posting the summaries to both of those discussions in the chat box shortly. We're then going to hear from Nanda Kelly, the project leader at the Dutch Ministry of Justice and Security, who will focus on the innovations and migration proposals from the commission 
and to look at whether or not they provide a solution to the practical bottleneck and what is needed to make progress in practice. And finally, but by no means least, we'll hear from Madalina Mararu, who is a research fellow at the European University Institute. And she is going to reflect on the implications of the pact on asylum and immigration and the EU's return system. But first, Yap, yeah, I'd like to turn to you and we're looking forward to hearing um, from you about whether or not you, th you think that the pact has struck the right balance between solidarity and responsibility. And in this context, you know, what do we mean by solidarity and what do we mean by um, responsibility? Over to you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom, and welcome to um, everybody in this uh, important uh, discussion. Um, I think deliberately I wanted to make a couple of rather general remarks to pave the way for the discussion on more detailed points. So uh, I select a number of global issues. The first being, um, it, it's a rather obvious issue. Uh, migration has been with us uh, over the centuries, will remain with us. And obviously in the complicated geopolitical times where we are living in these days, uh, the tension between uh, security here and conflict there manifests itself all the time. So whereas the European Union might be able to organize its internal household in a proper manner, we are now under pressure because of all these tensions coming from outside to the European Union. That's my first point. The second point is that um, I am of the opinion, and to that extent, I take a rather positive stand towards the new pact that we have to recognize that we are faced with a common problem which requires a common solution. Since we have created this internal market, this common economic space without internal obstacles, since we have created a common human space where hopefully all the member states respect fundamental values and standards, we necessarily have to cooperate at the external borders. So uh, you might even argue that here, constitutionally speaking, we are confronted with a system of which has some federalist uh, characteristic. Yeah, I won't go into, into detail, but nevertheless, in order to understand, it's a huge territory, which in principle we have to protect. Now, of course, perhaps it's not useful to go into the failures, 2015, 16, my third point, because there, although it's my opinion that we had uh, put in place adequate legislation as such, we were not prepared to, uh, to be confronted with such a huge number of migrants. You might blame us for that fact because we could see all these problems from the Arab Spring the beginning of 2010-11, we noticed all the problems taking place in Syria. See, we could have foreseen the issue, but we didn't essentially. And we left essentially all the burdens with those countries in the southern part of the EU, which had the responsibility to protect our external borders. So to that extent, the Schengen system collapsed. I should not uh, recall that the Dublin system collapsed and we were not able to put in place an efficient system for return of those migrants not having the right to stay in the European Union. So what we are essentially looking for are solutions for three main bottlenecks. They obviously first have to do with the protection of the external border, which is a rather complicated matter, especially when you are confronted with a border in sea. And we have seen all the tragedies in the Mediterranean, but of course that is a, a border which is very difficult to protect. Although we have also noticed uh, on, on land, on the continent, that obviously similar problems occur when huge uh, numbers of people present themselves at land borders. The second uh, bottleneck, of course, is how to handle applications of huge numbers of migrants, how to do this. And we left essentially all the burdens to uh, Greece and Italy, and to a certain extent also to Spain. And the return. 
So the external borders, how to handle uh, applications of big numbers of people and how to return those who have not tried to stay, these are the three sticking points. And again, I think all these three ask for common solutions where I think it should be welcomed, but politically a difficult step to take, that there is more central management, even more coordination more coordination, but I am tempted to say more central management from the Brussels Authority. Now, the new pact of September, of course, presents solutions for all these problems. So more effective protection by also uh, uh, asking for more cooperation between the national border police units and so on and so forth. A fast track procedure in order to select in an early stage applications of migrants who do not have a chance to succeed. That famous solidarity system and also implying burden chain with regard to the handling of the uh, uh, applications of migrants presenting themselves for protection. And there is a strong emphasis indeed for an adequate return policy where a central role has been foreseen for a uh, a European return coordinator, and of, of course also a more uh, intensive role for the European border and coast guard. Now, I think the, 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 the emphasis put on the return of those who have not a right to remain in the European Union is of course a logical one, it's a realistic one. The EU cannot welcome everybody, think about the consequences for income, uh, housing, food, uh, education, social medical, medical care, what have you. And certainly legal migration is of course also a, a dimension which has to be taken into account in light of capabilities, capacities, professional qualifications. But in the end, those who have been submitted to a thorough assessment of their request have eventually profited from an appeal procedure before a national court. In the end, you should argue over and out, and those who have not the right to stay in Europe, they simply must leave. And in that context, of course, we can make use, that's also an argument made by the Commission, of historic relations um, uh, individual member states have with certain countries. For example, in the Dutch case, it's very difficult to return illegal migrants from, from example, from Morocco. There are political obstacles, they have a bilateral characteristic, but why could we not profit from the arrangements made by France and Spain, for example, who have historic relations with the country and also concluded uh, arrangement with regard to the readmission of illegal migrants. So, and I think also in this respect, it's a logical uh, uh, proposal of the Commission to come forward with new sorts, new sorts of readmission agreements. We, we can step up with uh, um, uh, aid, uh, the development aid uh, 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 facilities, uh, visa facilitation. But on the other hand, I think also that's not the point the Commission particularly is making that the European Union in its totality can exercise much more economic pressure, making use of its economic capabilities. That's of course a reference to the common commercial policy and the common foreign security policy, which also is an important point. But with regard to the handling of these, uh, of, of the application, and there I come to your point about the, the solidarity and the resistance of, for example, Hungary and Poland to participate in the uh, relocation system, I think we must accept this. Uh, I mean, after years of unsuccessful uh, deliberation, negotiation, it's a political reality. And to the extent we can arrive to a sort of equivalent contribution from all sides, the Commission calls it a fair share. So you take your responsibility, but we measure it as a fair share. And the Commission has uh, uh, proposed in this context the critical mass correction. So I think we simply should do it. So if they are refusing to take over in the framework of relocation, in case a country uh, experiences pressure, if they are unwilling to uh, receive in the framework of relocation, a number of migrants, then at least they should do something differently, which on an equivalent basis can be measured at, at the same level. So to the extent that they take this fair share, be it 
that they take the responsibility for, uh, uh, the Commission calls it return sponsorships or providing operational assistance, uh, sending immigration officers, providing for an uh, infrastructure, shelter, funding, or other kind of contribution. I think we should simply recognize that's the political reality where we are. Because I have the impression we cannot apply, for example, principles as enhanced cooperation. We simply exclude them from this policy. I think it's a fundamental area where we have to recognize that each and individual member state has a responsibility to take. So all in all, I think these proposals are fair, reasonable, they are pragmatic indeed, I should say, very flexible, but they are of course, and that's about uh, how the legislature will deal with them. They are technical, they are complicated, and they are most probably difficult to, to implement. One of my final points is I think that on the three main a sticking point, so the bottlenecks, uh, which I have signaled, so the, um, the uh, protection of the external borders, the handling of applications, and the putting into place of an effective return policy, we need more central management. And I think there the Commission is relatively uh, modest in a way. They come forward with the idea of the return coordinator and they come forward with a more intensive role of the, uh, the European Border and Coast Guard. And we have concluded and decided that they will have an operational staff of 10,000 up to 2027. But I think realistically we must recognize in light of this the global characteristics of the problematics that we have to give much more trust to the commission in the end or at least to the european union to take here a central responsibility now of course we have not solved all the problems i think the backlogs at uh, reference of course is in the first place to Moria, the island of Lesbos. We have to solve that as a first priority. And I think what is still a major defect is that so far we have not uh, um, been able to develop a list of common safe countries. And that is, I think, a serious problem. We have to think about it. I think the new pact doesn't provide for adequate solutions. So you have to look for a kind of average rate of acceptance in the member states, can we consider Afghanistan, what is it, Algeria as a safe third country, or can we not? I mean, to the extent that in that context, there are differentiated opinions depending of the member state, I think it's a very difficult, uh, that, that is difficult to uh, accept. And of course, as I said before, there are other dimensions as well, which we have to take into account that you reference to the uh, development uh, side. We have to, of course, not lose out of sight that there is the issue of how can we contribute to create more stability in the countries of origin? How can we provide for safe havens where we take our responsibility by examining the applications there in the region in order to prevent that these migrants have to undertake all kinds of dangerous travels and so forth and so further. So that is certainly also on the plate, but for this moment I wanted to, to concentrate on the three bottlenecks. So the protection of the external borders, how to handle applications for protection and how to arrive at an adequate return system where my main point is we have to recognize that in that context we have to give more trust to the EU institutions, and we need more central management and coordination. The alternative being that the whole system will not work. We were coming back to the, uh, the horrifying experience 2015 and 16. So it's essentially political will what is needed, and not only in the frame of global discussions, EU Conference of Ministers of Interior, but also in the detail of the legislative uh, measures, because uh, separately from the communication, the Commission has presented their proposals for regulations, for recommend whatsoever, and there also the member states have to demonstrate this idea of more trust and more confidence. We have to do it together in a flexible, pragmatic way, and each and, in, and every member state has to provide a contribution which is at least equivalent to the one of the others. For the moment, that's it. 
Thank you very much. And under 15 minutes, which is great, which will leave us hopefully some time, more time for questions at the end. So please do think about your questions for Yap and for other speakers while you're listening. Um, now we're going to hear from um, Nanda Kelly, who is currently working at the Dutch Ministry for Justice and Security and at the Migration Policy Institute. And she's been working on asylum and migration policy for 16 years, both in Brussels and in The Hague. Nanda, we look forward to hearing from you about the innovations in the migration proposals from the Commission and whether or not these innovations solve some of the bottlenecks and other ideas you might have in how to make progress in practice. Nanda, over to you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Yad, for kicking off with this interesting discussion. Um, yes, for the previous um, four years, actually, I've been uh, negotiating um, the seven proposals which came out in 2016 um, for hours and hours and hours in windowless rooms within the council, because that's what we do, basically. We go from article to article and we try to find an agreement. Um, and I was negotiating um, for the Netherlands each of these seven proposals. So um, when looking at the new proposals published in September this year, of course, one of the first things then to look at is what is new, right, from the previous seven proposals and what will actually change the discussion that we had and that unfortunately led to agreement on a technical level for, I would say, about 90% of all of these articles I'm talking about, but for 10% disagreement on the political level um, and actually trickling down to the technical level on the very kind of controversial elements of all these proposals. Being, of course, the solidarity mechanism, uh, the balance between responsibility and solidarity, and also being the border procedure, uh, which was also already discussed in the previous round. So what I think actually are the innovations in these new proposals having been published in September, uh, I want to focus on four of them. And when I say innovations, I don't really mean things that have never been discussed because that's actually kind of impossible in the asylum and migration area. It kind of seems like everything has already been discussed. But um, I think the commission actually did manage to listen very well and they went out there, right? They visited all the member states, the commissioners did and at other levels as well to discuss, okay, what is it that you want from the new proposals and to kind of think this through and then put it in these new proposals. And I want to focus on four of the innovations in there. So first of all is indeed the combination of the screening procedure together with the border procedure, which they introduce as a procedure at the external borders of the EU to first uh, put all arrivals through a screening procedure, having to, uh, to do a medical check, to do a security deck, and to do like a first identification. Um, and then if indeed this person is from uh, having a nationality, which is below 20% recognition rate, this person, for example, would go to the border procedure, which is kind of a closed transit zone-like procedure. Uh, from where this person will be returned if his or her asylum claim is rejected. So that's the first kind of innovation, so you will. The second one is the new element which they added to the solidarity mechanism, which is the return sponsorships. So the solidarity mechanism, when it comes to relocation or providing support to member states under disproportionate pressure in the form of materials or experts was already there. But the Commission has now added a new element, which is return sponsorships, meaning that member states can also support other member states on a disproportionate pressure by not only taking over genuine refugees, but also taking over um, clearly manifestly unfounded asylum seekers who need to be returned to their country of origin and trying to do the actual return. This, of course, stems also from um, the situation that indeed return has proven to be difficult practically for member states, and it does uh, put member states under pressure. So there's still a lot of questions on these return sponsorships uh, from member states, but I think um, that's always the case for innovative development, so this is surely one of them. 
Then the third element is actually an instrument to tackle secondary migration. A lot of discussion um, has taken place about secondary migration in the EU in the previous round. And the Commission has tried to come up with a way to tackle secondary migration. And what they have put in the proposals is that one can actually use or apply the screening procedure, so normally meant for the external borders of the EU, also to somebody who uh, is encountered by the authorities in the EU territory or on the EU territory, but not having any documents for legal stay, um, nor uh, coming up in the databases as somebody who was screened at the uh, external borders. So one can then apply the screening procedure to that person, which would actually indeed be an instrument to tackle uh, secondary migration. The fourth element is labour migration. So the Commission has not included much yet in these proposals from September on labour migration, but they did promise to come up with a series of discussions and a new strategy on legal pathways next year. Then, these four innovations, are they the solutions to the bottlenecks, which uh, already described as well by YAP, to the bottlenecks that we have in the EU? Well, I think in order to look at the bottlenecks, we need to go um, a layer deeper, so you will. We need to look at what's behind these bottlenecks. So the first bottleneck um, is actually that 70% of currently of the asylum seekers' claims are rejected in the EU. So the asylum procedure, which of course focuses on distinguishing between people who have an eligible claim for asylum and people who do not, is now focusing on the majority of asylum seekers actually not having an eligible claim. So a lot of time and capacity is now spent on 70% um, of the arrivals actually being rejected, hence having to be returned. So the issue is that much of this capacity is actually spent in destination member states. So in member states like Germany, Sweden, et cetera. The idea of the screening and the border procedure would be to move this forward at the start of the procedure. So when people actually arrive at the EU and then already there to make a distinction between asylum seekers who are eligible and who are not eligible, which would actually save a lot of capacity uh, and time spent in the back of the procedure in destination member states. I think it would actually be a good idea to have this screening and border procedure in order to distinguish between this big group of manifestly unfounded asylum seekers and asylum seekers who are clearly genuine refugees or who form part of this group, which is also quite large, but who form part of this group where we need to look again at their asylum claim in order to establish whether or not it's eligible. So yes, on this first innovation, the screening and border procedure, although indeed there are many arguments to be made that, of course, it's not so easy to do this indeed at sea borders as it is at an international airport, I do think that this concept is actually the right concept. Then on the solidarity mechanism, um, even with this new element of return sponsorships, I'm afraid to say that I don't think that the Commission has been able to square the circle. But then again, we can't blame the Commission because the circle cannot be squared on solidarity mechanism. It's simply impossible. At least I've never uh, heard anybody coming up with a solution, which is the perfect solidarity mechanism for the EU member states with all their vastly different interests and then saying, yes, of course, we agree to this solidarity mechanism. So, so no, I don't think it's the perfect solution. And to be honest, um, at the political level, I don't think it's the solution, but there is no solution to this. So we have to find another way um, to solve this issue. Then on the third element, on secondary migration, destination member states such as Germany, Sweden, etc., still receive um, 40 to 50% of their arrivals on registered asylum seekers. So not popping up in any database and not having been registered or having been registered but data lost again, etc. So actually this already indicates that the current system actually is not functioning properly. It should not be possible for Sweden 
which is kind of the last member state you end up in if you arrive somewhere in the south and you go up to still receive 40 to 50 percent of the asylum seekers which have not been registered anywhere in the EU or at least we cannot find the data anymore in the databases because this data in Eurodac for example is actually deleted after 18 months of stay in the EU. So this is something we need to tackle and to apply the screening procedure to indeed this category of asylum seekers being encountered on the EU territory instead of at the external borders would actually be an instrument for this. So I do think that that's a useful instrument. Then the fourth innovation, looking at the labour migration um, legal avenues and trying to continue with the pilot projects that actually some member states have started with uh, under the coordination of the Commission is also a good way to look at this. But what we need to take into account as well is actually the appeal of illegal labour in the EU. It is possible to be an illegal labour migrant and make a living in the EU. And actually, this is something we need to look at as well in order for this to be a solution to this kind of pull factor that we have in the EU, namely people who just come for the EU to actually work, they don't have sufficient legal avenues. So what they do, they go to the EU, they um, file an asylum claim because they know the asylum procedure actually takes quite a long time in some member states or in most member states. And then they work illegally because that's possible in the meantime. This is a poor factor which needs to be addressed. And we can only do that by looking at the labour migration uh, law in the EU itself as well. So, third element of my presentation is, okay, so partly there are solutions in the proposals um, published by the Commission in September, but unfortunately, because of the controversial elements at the political level, I think it will be quite tough to actually have an agreement on the overall um, package, on the overall proposals. Um, I've already seen a paper coming out this week from four Mediterranean countries saying we only agree to a mandatory border procedure if we have mandatory relocation. And that kind of rings a bell for this question we had two years ago, four years ago, etc. Namely, there are also member states who say no way mandatory relocation. So how do we combine all of this? I think actually parallel to the negotiations on the Commission proposals, there needs to be progress in practice in order to make the discussion in the Council easier. So what we need to show is that there can be progress in practice, even without perhaps an agreement on the legislative files. So first of all, on this border procedure, there are already some member states who have applied the border procedure at international airports. So why don't we start off with actually applying this border procedure at all the international airports in the EU and agree with each other that that would be a good starting point to kind of gain experience with what a, a border procedure actually is. What do you need to apply a border procedure in practice? How many actors do you need? How do they need to work together, et cetera, et cetera? I think that would be a good start. Everybody agrees that international airports is like the most easy environment to do this. Then why don't we? It would also coincide well with the implementation of the databases that we have set ourselves up for. Um, so that would be a good kind of practical agreement that we can make all of the member states to do this in the next like two years. Then on the second point on the solidarity mechanism. Solidarity has actually been given to Southern member states for the past few years. If you look at the funding that went to Greece, for example, but also the support from EU agencies, the support from experts from member states, etc. I think this is what we need to continue doing. There has been relocation, not from all member states, but from quite a big group of member states from Greece, for example. So it's not like solidarity is not happening. We need to look at how solidarity is happening and how we can stimulate that it actually broadens or continues. For this, it would be a good idea to actually have the EOAM mandate being agreed ahead or in parallel of the negotiations. 
Then on the third element, on secondary migration, what one sees is that member states are working more and more together at the internal borders, also because of COVID, to be honest. There was more cooperation needed at the internal borders, also sometimes in order to keep the internal borders open during the COVID crisis. Let's continue working on that. How can we go from internal border controls to control borders? And then fourthly, there is a new labor agency. I said we need to work on actually, um, well, kind of fighting the, the pull factor of illegal labor. This new labor agency can do that. We need to give it the mandate and the instruments for it. So I think a lot of progress can be made in parallel to these negotiations taking place in the Council on the proposals. And this progress will actually make the discussion easier in the Council. And that would be my message for today. Thanks. Thank you, Nanda. Coming in bang on 15 minutes, which is quite an amazing feat considering all the things you managed to, um, to talk about. And uh, thank you for being so practical and presenting um, policy solutions, uh, as well as um, critiquing the, the pact. Right now, going on to um, Madalena Moraru, who is a research fellow at the European University Institute. And Madalena, we're looking forward to hearing from you about what you think will be the impact on um, the EU's return system from, from, these, from, the, uh, from, from the pact on um, asylum and immigration. So over to you, Madalena. Thank you very much, Tom, for the kind introduction. And also thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, and yes, I've decided actually to reflect on a particular aspect uh, regarding the impact of the Pact on Asylum and Migration uh, only on uh, returns. Um, and why is that? Um, I consider that if we read all the five legislative acts that were introduced by the Pact, um, actually returns feature as importantly as asylum in the Pact. Um, they are quite a red thread uh, running across all the five legislative acts. And not only, actually, the Commission will also introduce next year two soft law acts, one on a new position in the European Commission, uh, so creating a sort of EU return uh, coordinator, and then also proposing a strategy on uh, voluntary returns and uh, reintegration. Um, so what I am thinking to do is not to go into the details of actually the new uh, common um, return systems, because some of the mechanisms on returns and the instruments have already been presented by the previous speakers. Um, but what I propose to do is perhaps focus more on, on, on the challenges in the implementations. Um, and also take a particular perspective of actually how courts um, have uh, contributed to the implementation of return so far, um, and whether the pact actually takes into consideration uh, courts' responses so far. Um, so I've mentioned already that um, the returns actually spread across all five legislative instruments, and actually. Uh, even more detailed um, regulation is found in the Commission proposal for the recast of the return directive that was proposed in 2018. So if we look at this new regulatory framework, it is completely different from the current status quo in the majority of the member states, because uh, the approach so far has been to actually keep these two procedures, the asylum procedure and the return procedure quite separately. Um, and a majority of member states have um, different administrative decision-making and competent courts in return procedures compared to asylum procedure. Uh, so the proposal of the pact will actually challenge quite a lot the member state in terms of implementation, because it's a complete paradigm shift in how they have to organize procedurally um, this uh, revised or redesign um, uh, return system proposed by the pact. Um, and as uh, already mentioned before, um, it's not only a change in mindset, but also uh, quite a high pressure on the national capabilities. 
meaning that um, as the PAC proposes, it seems the uh, return border procedure will be the new normal. Uh, and that would imply uh, new capacities, uh, human um, resources, uh, but also quite a more extensive burden on monitoring bodies. And as the situation stands now in the member states, not all of them uh, have uh, national human rights institutions with um, equally uh, powerful monitoring powers. Uh, so that will also mean quite a, an important change for member states in terms of securing fair and adequate monitoring uh, system. Um, so this could be one of the challenges in terms of the new proposals, that is the return border procedures. Um, there's also um, a new mechanism that was introduced and it was already anticipated before, the return sponsorship mechanism, uh, which seems to have been the remedy to the lack of consensus so far, uh, or at least this was presented in, in the press releases and in the conferences held so far. Um, and I would say my position is that this is uh, perhaps um, a more safe in terms of fair procedure than the return border uh, procedure. Um, because there is a more flexibility to a certain extent left to the member states compared to the return border procedures. And one important uh, provision in the pact is that member states will have flexibility to decide whether to recognize or not the return decision issued by the member states they're supporting. Uh, and this will actually avoid a sort of uh, Dublin three uh, scenario. Uh, but nevertheless, just to conclude, because I would like to leave some moments also for the discussion, I think um, there should be a closer attention paid to judicially developed standards. Um, and I've developed uh, this argument much more in a book that I published uh, this year, and it's called Law and Judicial Dialogue on the Return Procedures. I have the book here with me. Um, and I would like to mention that there's been last month three important judgments, uh, one from the European Court of Human Rights against uh, Finland uh, for their assistant voluntary returns to Iraq. And that particular program developed by Finland uh, was actually found to be in violation of Article 2 and 3. And this is important because there will be a new uh, proposal made by the Commission next year on such programs. Um, and this kind of judicial standard should be taken into consideration much more. Uh, the same goes also for the return border procedures. There are two important judgments delivered by the Court of Justice uh, end of September on the principle of uh, non refoulement and how Belgian legislation, which lacks uh, clarity on suspensive effect of appeals and access to social assistance of returnees, uh, breaches um, Article 19 to, um, of, the U, um, of the U Charter and Article 47. Um, so whenever um, negotiations um, are prepared on the pact, I think there should be definitely closer attention paid uh, to what the courts are saying and their responses should be taken into consideration more in the drafts uh, proposed. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your attention and, and I'm looking forward for discussion. Thank you, Madalena. So we have 15 minutes uh, left for discussion and um, I posted the link to Madalena's book in the chat if you want to find a link to it. Uh, for more information um, about that. Now, um, we have one request so far for a question or a comment, and that's from Joanna Lopez. So Joanna, please uh, please go ahead, take, take yourself off mute, and we look forward to hearing your, your comments or your question. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, yourself for the interventions. Mm -hmm. um, my question is pertaining to the, the crisis itself. Uh, as you know, this is a humanitarian crisis, and uh, we believe that um, even though Europe has a, a good um, performance in terms of receiving refugees and asylum seekers, um, nevertheless, the perception from the, the citizens might be different. So I would like to ask all the speakers to give their views on how they see the next decade. Do they believe that this refugee crisis 
uh, is solved with this pact on uh, migrations or do they believe that it is um, something that is already finished? So they believe that uh, the, the years of 2015 and 2016 will never happen again based on this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Sorry, I forgot to ask, um, who, could you introduce yourself? Who, who do you work for? Uh, well, I'm currently uh, in the process of presenting uh, a thesis on this subject at a, a university called Universidade Autónoma de Lisboa. I'm not a researcher, I'm a student. Okay, great. Thank in you Portugal. Portugal. Um, Madalina, you're off mute, so I'll go to you first in that case. Uh, yes, well, quite a big uh, question. And of course, I don't think uh, uh, the pact could entirely solve uh, the crisis. Uh, but what we read, at least in the press releases, is that there is definitely a contribution that is aimed to be made in terms of managing future crises. Um, there's a new instrument dedicated to crisis management. Um, and of course, the introduction of the return sponsorship uh, as a sort of additional form of solidarity mechanism um, is quite a novel idea and could, could contribute more in practice. But as was uh, anticipated before by one speaker, it very much depends on the agreement between the member states. So far, uh, some have um, had quite a positive approach. Um, but it, it remains to, to be seen. But uh, nevertheless, what I think is a problem that is still present and will remain is that of the implementation. So if we look, member states still have problem in implementation of 2013 legislative package. The European Commission brought infringement procedure against Portugal and Hungary um, a few weeks ago for the implementation of the current a lack of improper implementation of the current asylum procedure. So we have to be aware that the problem cannot be saved simply by proposing new legislation, uh, but we really have to focus on adequate implementation. Also what we have in force now uh, with adequate implementation, uh, could some of the problems could be solved. Um, and uh, in terms of the fact, I think definitely it should be closer attention to the type of flexibility that is advertised because the flexibility so far is emphasized on the two options of solidarity while as we see in terms of return burden procedure there's definitely less flexibility for the member states which means higher burden on implementation so we have to be aware of both the added value and the challenges uh, in the future thank you Thank you. Nanda, do you have any um, thoughts in response to Joanna's question? Yes. I'm, first of all, I'm looking at like a decade further means that we would need to look at forecasting as well. And I think this is a topic uh, within the asylum and migration area that has grown over the last few years because um, rightfully so, I think some people actually asked the question, could we not see the 2015-16 crisis coming before it actually happened? And I think, yes, we could uh, for uh, quite a large part. I mean, we knew um, in 2014 already, for example, that there were large groups of uh, Syrian uh, refugees in Turkey. Um, so Forecasting is, I think, one of the elements of the asylum and migration policy that we need to develop further and that we need to look into in order to see whether we can kind of more predict these flows coming to the EU. Uh, secondly, can we prevent another crisis? Uh, no, uh, we cannot. And I agree fully with uh, Madalina that um, this is for a large part because of not having implemented the current EU legislation. There is already a, there are a lot of instruments in the current EU legislation that if we were to implement them fully and cooperate more between the member states on implementing them fully because of realizing that we have an open area, then uh, we would make a lot of progress um, in the coming years. And I think this is something we need to look into more 
and we need to look at um, there are many examples. For example, the Netherlands has agreed with Greece to assist Greece in setting up a guardianship system for unaccompanied minors in Greece. So this is one of the examples, actually, which is fairly new, that these kind of examples uh, for the last few years that are popping up everywhere and that are very positive examples, I think, about how we can implement current EU legislation. I feel this is where we need to work on mostly in order to be prepared for the next decade. Um, third point is that asylum and migration policy consists of many, many different elements, and it never helps if somebody takes out just one element, looks at it and says, you know, it doesn't work. No, because it can only work if you if you look at all the different elements in parallel and you make progress on all these different elements. And uh, so this is what we need to do. Thank you, Nanda. Yap, do you have anything to add to the, those responses? Well, I think uh, Joanna put a very relevant question. It's a rather fundamental one. How to get the support of the ordinary citizen with all the efforts we are undertaking? I mean, this is the, the, the crucial, but also the eternal problem. I think it's about communication. It's about uh, explanation. It's about accountability. And the problem here is, of course, there are detentions. We are discussing about the fate of human beings in difficulty, in problems, because also economic uh, migrants looking for a better freedom, they also have to be uh, uh, treated in a very fair and human manner. Now, I think here, of course, you are also confronted with the tension between national and EU competences. I think with regard to the EU, uh, uh, dimension of the responsibility, the Commission does a good job. They, they are simply open-minded, they present their ideas, they explain their ideas, they communicate them in a rather uh, good manner. However, the primary responsibility to get on board the, the citizens is with the national authorities, not only the ministers, but also members of national parliaments. It's the eternal problem, but this is a more particularly sensitive issue. If you look at, the, if you present the, the crisis in the Greek islands, Lesbos, uh, the Moria, you, can, you have to explain this and you have to solve it, of course. So for me, the solution here is in the hands primarily of the national authorities, the ministers in the first place, but also members of national parties, the public debate, the universities, these kind of, of conferences, and how we are able to develop an outreach to the ordinary citizen. That's, I think, we have to understand. So the first issue, this is a common problem which requires common solutions. If politicians do not understand the logic of that, I mean, we are, we are more or less lost in order to get the support of the citizens. So you're, your question is a very uh, relevant one. The answer is not so very uh, uh, difficult in a way to the extent that our national politicians are communicators. And so far, I think they have to learn their lessons as well. Thank you, yeah. And I think I would, I would add to that, that as well as policymakers influencing public opinion and support for um, reform or implementation of migration policies, the media have a large role to play. I wonder how do you three think that media in your countries um, have covered the, the pact? Has it been um, largely reported on? Has it been ignored? Has it been misunderstood? Has it been used uh, you know, to, to fight political battles within countries how do you and more widely how do you think that the the media has if anything moved on from the largely humanitarian frame that migration was reported on in 2015-16 going on to more security focused um 16-17 because of you know events um that that happened since then um how do you think media is coping with reporting on these policy issues but also influencing policymakers and what what do you think could be done differently by journalists who report on this issue to help put pressure on politicians in perhaps to hold them accountable but also to play a more constructive role in the public understanding of the motivations and the practicalities of these um, of these policies well i think um 
That's, that's also a very good point. So my reasoning is always the politicians at the European level, the national level, the media, the universities, and what have you, NGOs also. So I think, um, generally speaking, of course, there is a lot of attention in the national media for the, for the, for the problems, but it's essentially the focus in, on what's happening today, what happened yesterday. And of course, it's always very difficult for the media to provide the global overview to give the sort of understanding. So the, the focus is essentially on facts, and especially if uh, the people, television is confronted with the dramas on the Rig Islands, for example, you cannot expect that the people will understand the background of the whole idea, the logic, how to try to find uh, political solutions. So what you need is a more global overview, and that's probably a bridge too far to uh, to cover by uh, the media. So there you need really the support of the NGOs, the academics, conferences like this one. But you should have the citizens here also uh, as, as participants in, in our conference. So um, essentially media attempted, of course, what's the news today? Uh, and then more particularly, what are the, uh, the, the, the bad developments and not so much what is uh, trying to be uh, achieved in a more global manner. So yes, they are responsible. I think they can do more, but it requires, it, uh, requires another mindset, a more open-mindedness towards the other dimensions of the problem than only the facts of today and, and yesterday. Thank you, yeah. And um, before I go to Nanda and Madalena for a final comment, is there anyone who has not written in the comments section who'd actually like to Make a very quick comment or question. We have two minutes left. If not, I'll just ask um, Nanda and Madalena to give their, their final thoughts in the last two minutes. Okay, Nanda, let's go to you first. Yes, just shortly, I'm to answer indeed your question about the media as well. I think the um, asylum and migration crisis of 2015 and 16 has helped a lot in actually um, gaining more data and making more data on asylum and migration available to the big public. Just like the financial crisis, it doesn't make you an expert on finances and you don't know all the details, but at least there's more knowledge now than there was before 2015. However, in order to make progress in a certain policy area, uh, my experience is that it's actually never a good idea to be on the front page. That's not the moment when to make progress. The moment to make progress is when you actually go down again to like page six, seven, uh, and then like the main attention at the main political level and in the national parliaments is kind of gone again, and then is the moment to make progress. So this is, I think, a bit of a problem now with uh, migration, that on the one hand, there's a lot of progress to be made at technical level, et cetera, but there's still a bit too much attention at the political level and in the media. So actually as a policymaker, I hope that we kind of move away from the front page again, uh, and then we can make a bit of progress. However, with, as you rightfully pointed out, developments, um, terrorist attacks, even recently, and uh, as a consequence, a discussion on Schengen and the future of Schengen, I'm afraid that this will actually not happen, that we will maintain our position on the front page and we'll have to find a way to still make progress. Okay, thank you, Nanda. Madalena, we have just reached an hour. So if you have one final thought to share um, before we wrap up. Uh, two actually ideas that I would like to raise very shortly. Your question is related, I think, to the freedom of media. Um, I live and work in, in uh, four different countries, uh, Czech Republic, Italy, Romania, and Austria. Um, and I have to say that what they all have in common um, in what was reported in uh, regard to the refugee crisis is a lack of, of freedom and also views of media to um, pressure the courts. If you if you are reading uh, the newspapers in the Czech Republic, it was horrible. Uh, and also in Belgium, I had judges that were accused of irresponsibility for their decision in asylum and, and horrible other stories. Uh, and one other thing that uh, it wasn't mentioned so far, and I would like to raise a reflection on that, is the detention of children. Uh, 
Um, I think that's one aspect that has been kept by the pact um, and with uh, no mention of uh, alternatives for detention in particular to children. And I think there should be definitely closer attention uh, to this situation in the future. Thank you, Madalena, and thank you for being so um, swift in your, in your final two points. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you all for, for joining us today. And thank you to TEPSA and uh, the uh, Nova University for bringing us here. And just finally signing off, as, as, a, as a Brit, I really appreciate being invited to these forums still. And I hope that um, there'll still be opportunities to collaborate and talk with my uh, European friends, uh, despite um, the impending, and I use the word impending deliberately to express my um, depression at, <laughs> at what is going to be soon be happening, but I hope that we can continue to collaborate despite the fact that my freedom of movement will soon be somewhat restricted um, within the EU. But thank you all for joining us and thank you again for our hosts for bringing us all here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye.